hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, um, Ezekiel chapter 29. That 28th chapter is a fantastic chapter, letting you know who the king of Babylon and the end times is. The old prince, the king of Tyre, Tyrus, rock. Their rock is not our rock. It's that old cherubim that got kicked from heaven and has already been sentenced to die in the 18th and 19th chapter of that book none other than Satan himself. Now, as we continue here, we are six months minus three days from the fall of the city, Jerusalem. Now, what you, well, how does that apply to us today? Well, the king of Babylon in the end times is still Satan. He's the false prophet, Antichrist, king of Babylon that appears in the great book of Revelation. And these chapters that follow now up through about 31 have to do with their influence by the king of Babylon, even of the end times in a prophetic sense when you look to the future. Having said that, that puts you, or it should be very important to you, to understand what befalls the nations, whereby you can center yourself with current events and God's word concerning this season the season that is within the parable of the fig tree. Okay, having said that, chapter 29, uh, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, In the tenth year, in the tenth month, in the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, leaving no doubt who's talking, God's talking to us. Two, son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt and prophesy against him, not for him, but against him, and against all Egypt. You know, uh, our people always kind of look to any time that the uh, king of Babylon was trying to take over, uh, Pharaoh always said, come on, lean on me. I'll, I'll help you. You know, and our people always would lean on him. When Who should they really have leaned on? Almighty God. See, there, you know, when God leads our people into a battle, never in history have we lost. But our forefathers many times went on battles on their own. Without God's approval, they lost every one, basically. So uh, that's why this is ever so important. It's going to come to pass. Listen to it. Verse 3, speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Now just hold on a minute. We're talking about the Nile here, and Pharaoh did not make the Nile. God did. Our father did. And that's who they should have leaned on. But here he is kind of bragging. He's that old crocodile of the river being spoken of symbolically. Verse 4, And I will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scales, and I will bring thee up out of the midst of thy rivers, and all the fish of thy rivers shall stick unto thy scales. That is, your people are going to stick there with you. I'm going to pull you away from that fertile uh, Nile and drop you off out in the desert. Verse 5, And I will leave thee thrown into the wilderness, desert. Thee and all the fish of thy rivers, your, your uh, people, thou shalt fall upon the open fields, thou shalt not be brought together nor gathered, I have given thee for meat to the beast of the field and to the fowls of the air. You know, uh, God would always promise that Egypt would be a base nation. It would always be. It's one of the oldest nations um, that has uh, continuously in the world. 
but never was it a superpower, always base, always low, compared to superpowers. Verse 6, and all, the, all, and all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord. That's his purpose. That's what he wants. Because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. Now, do you know what a staff of a reed, you know what a staff is? A staff is a walking cane. It's something you use to walk with. Only, what happens if you use a reed? A reed's pretty shaky, pretty flimsy. If you use that for a walking stick, you're going to fall, okay? As a matter of fact, this was uh, written in 2 Kings 18.21. I want to read it to you. 2 Kings 18.21, listen carefully. Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust in him. 22, but if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? In other words, don't, don't depend on a reed for a staff when God has given you instructions. God has written chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through various books of the prophets as well as the unveiling, revelation, exactly how it's going down. You, as a Christian, have a choice. You can listen to man, or you can listen to your heavenly Father through the Word of God. That's up to you. But if you start depending and leaning on the traditions of men, it's going to poke you right through the hand, and you're going to fall. And, and a mighty fall it shall be. We continue then back in chapter 29, verse 7. Listen carefully. When they took hold of thee by the hand, by thy hand, thou didst break and rend all their shoulders. That's their hands. You just cut right through. And when they leaned upon thee, thou breakest and madest all their loins to be at a stand. You made them shake. Well, they depended on you. You gave them great promises and so forth. When they leaned on you and turned away from me, naturally they were shaken. They had something to shake about. Anytime you put your trust in someone other than Almighty God, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. That's what the lesson is. And unfortunately, that has to happen more than one time in, throughout even history. I suppose for some people, they never learn. Verse 8. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring a sword upon thee, and cut off man and beast out of thee. Uh, Adam, the word man, man here is Adam. There's not going to be any Adamites among you. This would indicate that the shepherd kings who settled half of the southern part of Egypt, which many of you is a different study, different time, the Hyksos. Well, you see, the Egyptians would not raise sheep. The sheep that were produced in Egypt were produced by the shepherd kings, which were none other than our own people in, in that time. A different study, different time. But um, there wasn't any of them left, and sure enough, uh, the shepherd kings did leave. Verse 8, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring a sword upon thee, and cut off man. We read that, and, and that came to pass. Who was the sword? It was Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And that's the way it's going to be in the end times. The king of Babylon, Satan, is going to come as the false messiah, and they're all going to whore after him. You can count on it. It is written. It will come to pass exactly as it's written. Verse 9, And the land of Egypt shall be desolate and waste. They shall know that I am the Lord, because he hath said, The river is mine, and I have made it. Pharaoh made nothing other than a mess. And uh, certainly, uh, our, our Heavenly Father, um, who made that river, um, it, it was hankied with a little bit. We'll read of that in the next verse, 10. Behold, therefore I am against thee and against thy rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate from the tower of Sheen, even unto the border of Ethiopia. 
Do you know where Syene is? That's where the Aswan Dam was built by the Russians that stopped the great floods of the Nile that made fertile the lower part along the river, and it, it makes it desolate because man messed with it and put the Aswan Dam there. And that happened in your generation. If you got, if you're, uh, were here when the parable of the fig tree began its motion in 1948, <clears throat> these things come to pass as it's written. And it laid a lot of bottom land that was fertile and fed a lot of people uh, to not have those floods of, that were made fertile ground all over Egypt to, to grow crops. 11. No foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast shall pass through it, neither shall it be inhabited forty years. Uh, and, uh, and, so, so, and so it is. Verse 12. And I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate. And her cities among the cities that are laid waste shall be desolate forty years. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. And Nebuchadnezzar did this, especially along with Alexander following it up. But you haven't seen anything yet until the king of Babylon hits them in the near future. They're ready. Because the king of Babylon, not only will he claim to be instead of Christ, he will be instead of all religions. And all religions, because of his supernatural abilities, will worship him, thinking their own uh, personage has returned to this earth to bring them salvation. And they'll whore after the false one, thinking it is their savior. Why? Because they haven't studied God's word. God has written it. It will come to pass exactly as it's written. Verse 13. Yet thus saith the Lord God, at the end of 40 years will I gather the Egyptians from the people whither they were scattered. 14. And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros, that's the southern part as well, into the land of their habitation, that's birth, where, where they became at birth of their nation, and they shall be there a base kingdom. Now that's God's promise that Egypt would always be a base, a small kingdom, not, not a superpower, but yet uh, that promise by God, they always would be. It, it would be through this Egypt, and I'll throw in a side note, that Jeremiah would take the daughters of Zedekiah, and there was even a place found where it would say over the door, daughters of Judah. In, in, in Palo Hebrew, and where Jeremiah went through and took those daughters to Skota and her sister to Europe, and Skota would later become Scotland. And from, from the other sister, we have King James, which you read the King James Bible. A lot more go through here than most people give credit for. Well, I can't hardly believe, it's okay. Put it on the shelf and smoke her there for a while. 15. It shall be the basest of the kingdoms, neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, no superpower, for I will diminish them that they shall no more rule over the nations. Because Israel always leaned on them instead of God. Yeah, but, but yet at the same time, he certainly did not destroy them. 16. And it shall be no more the confidence of the house of Israel, which bringeth their iniquity, their sin, to remembrance. When they shall look after them, but they shall know that I am the Lord God. You know, that's the whole point. Every plan of God basically has one, one ultimate wish on his part, is that they will know that not some nation like Pharaoh and his country, and not some other group of people, but God himself is our protector. God himself loves us, and we should return that love. And through that, he wants to protect us. 
And certainly he is not like a, a shallow reed that you would lean on, but he is a staff that you can count on, that you can depend on, that you can bet on. He is there for you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So follow your father. Let him know you love him. 17. And it came to pass in the 7 and 20th year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, we're getting pretty close down to the end of dates of, Jeremiah, of uh, Ezekiel. 18. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, and this is Nebuchadnezzar spelled differently, same one, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. That's to say, Tyrus, that rock, not our rock, being Satan itself. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled be because of men carrying weapons. Yet had he no wages, nor his army, for Tyrus, for the service that he had served against it. God said he, he did that nation Tyrus, that old flat rock, which was Satan's kingdom. He destroyed it for me, but he didn't have any pay, so I, I'm going to pay him back. Verse 19, 19, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. That is in the future sense is what you want to look at. For that king of Tyrus is going to return, who is now the king of Babylon, which is to say Satan, the king of Babylon in the great book of Revelation, is none other than the Antichrist, the false prophet, the devil, Satan, the serpent, whichever name you wish to call him by, and whichever name he goes by, because he goes by many, then at the same time, um, he's going to give them into his hand because of what? Because they haven't studied God's word. They're so easily misled in a one world system that's building and melting together, even at this time. Verse 20, I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor wherewith he served against it because they wrought for me, which saith the Lord God. In other words, God says, I had him do it. It was done for me. When, when our Father utilizes a people to correct a people, well, why did God do that? Because they misled his children Israel. They misled all the people that should have been looking to Almighty God, but it is a sin. And, and we are punished, our people are punished, when they lean upon people and nations rather than our Father. And this is a sad state of affairs when we come to the time that we are today, when many nations try to do away with the name of God. They try to, try to pre prevent people who worship the Lord Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, from even using that name. That's what we've come to, which means it should really put God's children on guard, and it should be a warning of what is under the undertow, because that undertow will grab you and take you right into Satan's camp if you allow it. And, you know, hey, if that's what you want, God will let you do it. Or you can stick with God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse and know and understand and be true to your Father and know that He is God, not some false prophet, not some false Christ. Verse 21, in that day, what day is that? Well, the day we're talking about. In that day will I cause the horn, horn is always symbolic of power, okay, of the house of Israel to bud forth. That power is going to come forth right from the bud, the house of Israel, and I will give thee the opening of the mouth in the midst of them. In other words, the word of God is coming from that mouth that will take it all over the world, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. The real truth, uh, not a bunch of lies, not a bunch of falseness, but God's word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Why? Because it's his word. 
You know, uh, well, when, when is that? In that day when it comes to pass. In the future since the time of the parable of the fig tree, as it is written in the great book of Daniel. Daniel closed the book. You're not going to understand. But in the end, the wise shall understand. So the horn and the power of Christ's people is coming forth, and that horn is being sounded. It's called the trumps. And those trumps are being sounded. And God lets his elect know when those trumps sound. He gives that signal, that time, saying, it is the day. Therefore, with his word and with his promise, we can boldly go forth knowing that we have the victory as long as you stick with your father. It's that simple. That's why you want to be sure and let him know that you love him. This is how it is with the nations. Have you been observing history? Have you been observing current events? You want to keep your eyes open. That's what happens to Egypt. Much of what is written there has come to pass in our generation. The Aslan Dam, what happened to the Nile River, and, um, and long before that, the leaving of the shepherd kings, the removing of our people from the southern part, the farmer rancher type, <coughs> and the moving away of the Hyksos, and the poorness then of the land. That's God's promise. It has come to pass, and so it is. Chapter 30, verse 1, and it reads, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, To son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, How ye, woe worth the day, uh, or, or uh, woe uh, be to the day. Three, for the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen, or the day of Jacob's trouble is what a lot of people call it, and it's called that in prophecy. Well, what is the Lord's day? Well, you know, this is really a simple thing, and people make it so difficult. A lot of people say, well, it, it, it's the weekend when we worship the Lord. No, that's not the Lord's day. This is why in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, John was taken to the Lord's day. Well, again, what well, is the Lord's day? That's the day we're talking about here. It's the millennium. There is more written about the millennium in this book of Ezekiel than, than there is in the entire New Testament. And we'll be getting there when we come to chapter 40. But how long is a day with the Lord? Well, uh, let me think. Well, think about 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Be not ignorant of this one thing. It's verse 6, maybe, in 7. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. Well, how long is a thousand years? It's a millennium. So we are talking about the millennium, and quite frankly, that's the day that the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth at the second advent, and it is his day. No one else's. He, he is the commander-in-chief. He is the ruler of all. And he will be here at that time. That day is coming. That's why he sent this letter, whereby we can prepare ourselves with the gospel armor on in place and prepare yourself for the day of Jacob's trouble and the day of the Gentile. You can read of it even in the New Testament in Luke chapter 21, when the end cannot be until the, the Lord will not return until this particular day of trouble comes, the time of the heathen. Verse 4, And the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia, when the slain shall fall in Egypt, and they shall take away her multitude, and her foundation shall be broken down. Five, Ethiopia, and Libya, and Lydia, and all the mingled people of Chub. This is to say Africa. And the men of the land that is in the league shall fall with them by the sword. And that is all of Africa and uh, the deception will be rampant. Verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, They also that uphold Egypt shall fall, 
and the pride of her power shall come down from the tower of Shen, which you know this is where the S1 dab is, dam rather, shall they fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord God. It'd be a nice place for them. And, um, and, and so it shall be, Syene, right there, right in plain open sight, built there by the Russians, and what a fantastic sight. Seven, and they shall be desolate. It's the day of the desolation in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her cities shall be in the midst of the cities that are wasted. You want to be careful when that prophecy of Matthew and 24 and Mark 13, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where he ought not, then you want to get out of Jerusalem, out of Judea. Well, what, what, did, what was Daniel talking about? Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. When the false Messiah comes in on the wings of desolation, he is the desolator. So that is not a condition, but an entity. It is none other than the Antichrist himself. So that desolation comes upon the whole world. And, and uh, too bad that many, well, our, our particular teaching doesn't have that in it. Well, that's, that's kind of sad because the Word of God does. Verse 8, and they shall know that I am the Lord. That's the purpose. Not that faith that's going to deceive them. But then on that day of the Lord, he comes. When I have set a fire in Egypt and when all her helpers shall be destroyed, when they're going to be broken, Verse 9, in that day shall messengers go forth from me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid, and great pain shall come upon them as in the day of Egypt, for lo, it cometh. Well, who are these messengers and who are these ships? Well, I don't know. What did... Um, what did uh, God's altar appear on in the first chapter of this great book of Ezekiel. It was a circular flying object. That's the way God sends messengers in the book of Ezekiel. By the river, and that means a length of time. The time that the horn comes forth and the truth goes forward and the trumpet sounds. So. Uh, that's one time that those messengers will come and they touch and instruct through the Holy Spirit and brings that horn of power to the platform which our Father provides that truth uh, can go to the world. Verse 10, Thus saith the Lord God, I will also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar Rezor, that is, king of Babylon, by the, by the false Christ. That's who symbolically in the future sense this means. Verse 11, what is he going to do? He and his people with him, the terrible of the nations, deceivers, shall be brought to destroy the land, and they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. Those that worship in that way are going to be sorely displeased when they find out the deception of who the true king of Babylon is of the great book of Revelation. That's why when some man would tell you, well, you don't need to understand the book of Revelation, you're going to be gone. They're lying to you. It's very important that you know every chapter of the book of Revelation with understanding, whereby you know what befalls us in these end days, in these end times, as these events come to pass, for they surely will, and are even now at the door, you can hear the knock. Have you noticed? Next verse, please, 12. And I will make the rivers dry, and sell the land into the hand of the wicked, and I will make the land waste, and all that is therein by the hand of strangers, I, the Lord, have spoken it. The strangers that came there and built the dam that destroyed what was below were the Russians, strangers there. But <clears throat> trying to help out, but helping out by fulfilling God's word. 
What is amazing to me is how many people can even be an atheistic nation against God, communist, and God will still use them exactly as he wishes to before he destroys them. That's why you want to be real careful as a child of God who, what word you adhere to. It had better be God's word because he's on the throne. He pulls the switch and he brings forth the truth. But um, <clears throat> the river of the end times that are dried up, usually rivers are set for boundaries. And what would it mean then if they were all dried up? You'd be in a one world system where there were no boundaries. You need to wake up. You could hear the knock on the door. One worldism trying to bring birth and uh, God standing in the way thereof. Next verse, please. Verse 13. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols and I will cause their images to cease out of Nop, that's Memphis, in Egypt, not uh, in, um, and, and not Tennessee, okay? Memphis in Egypt. And there shall be no more a prince of the land of Egypt, and I will put a fear in the land of Egypt. It's going to come to pass. 14, and I will make Pathros, that southern part, desolate, and I will set fire in Zoran, and, um, and will execute judgment in No. Zoan is where the shepherd kings were established. What a fantastic study to know and understand uh, the Hyksos, the shepherd kings, and what part they played in that southern part, and, and then they were gone. And it was pretty desolate after that. 15, and I will pour out my fury upon sin, the strength of Egypt, and I will cut off the multitude of no. This sin is right in the Sinai Desert, right where the law itself was given, whereby man could know and understand. I don't know, do you understand the law? Christ said, I don't change one jot of it, and then for, and, and, but I came to fulfill it. He shall. I don't know. Have you read it? It is all written. The thing is, you must understand it. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. We have one judge, that's our Father. He does not need our help in that. You do have the right to spiritually discern the power of the Holy Spirit as it guides you and gives you that gift of discernment whereby you make your own mind up and be responsible. It's your ship, you sail it, for you're the one that will answer to Almighty God. Think about it. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer. At the end of the hour, we'll give you our mailing address. Got a prayer request? You don't need a number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Right now, He does. And you don't even have to say it out loud. 
He's a cardio knower. He knows your heart. Therefore, what does he want from you? He wants your love. He simply wants you to love him for all that he has done for us. And it makes his day. So let it do that, won't you? He may not love what you're doing, but he sure loves you. Repent of it, all of your sins, and love him and be blessed. And um, how precious it is. Let's go to his throne. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. Judy from Georgia, Pastor Murray, Revelation 2013. Death and hell delivered up their dead which were in them. What does this mean if everyone is in heaven on one side of the gulf or the other? Um, that, that, this means the spiritually dead. They're in spiritual bodies and they're in heaven, but hey, if they didn't make it, they didn't make it. They were on the wrong side of the gulf. They have got to overcome and take part in the second resurrection or they're going to hell. Okay. It does not mean that they are dead, dead, like you think of dead in the flesh. Flesh is all gone. It's that you are spiritually dead, meaning you didn't make the cut. Okay. In my Strong's, Kenite, a member of a Canaanite tribe, am I looking at the wrong word for sons of Cain? In, in, the, Hebrew manuscript, in the Hebrew dictionary, in a correct Strong's, it's the word 7017. 7017 in the Hebrew dictionary. And it is sons of Cain. Okay? Uh, Kagan, if you would. Kajan. Uh, which Cain himself in the Hebrew dictionary is the word 7014 in the Hebrew dictionary. If, if your concordance doesn't do that, you need to order one from the chapel. Many people are printing Strong's Concordances and they're redoing it by computer, and if it slips one notch, it throws everything off. So you want to be very careful. That's why we're very particular in what Strong's we carry. The original McDonald's press was the best ever done, but that went out of print many years ago, but we try to stay as close to that as possible. Christopher from South Carolina. What is the difference between the angel of the Lord and the Lord himself? Well, the angel of the Lord is the presence of the Lord, but he is in a different dimension than we are, so he has to send that. What, what does the word angel mean? Messenger. And God does send messengers, not every day and not to everyone, but he does send messengers, and they always have a message and it's always very meaningful. But it, it is the very presence of God in spirit form, or the Holy Spirit, if you prefer. Carlos from Arkansas. How long is the short season that Satan is released from, from at the end of the millennium? Usually, you can equate a short season to the five months that the seven-year period was shortened to. That's a short time. Uh, your documentation you will find in Revelation chapter 12, when Satan is kicked from heaven by Michael, that old, that old dragon, the serpent, uh, the devil is cast from heaven, and woe, woe to you on earth, for he knows he has but a short time, and that short time is five months, okay? So we can pretty well assume that uh, five months at the end also, however, Man doesn't have anything to do with the battle at the end of the millennium. Only God does, and sometimes he works pretty fast. When he's through with Satan and those that didn't cut it, he's a consuming fire. They will be consumed. Gloria from Louisiana. Are there more than Ten Commandments? Well, there are commandments and instruction, statutes, and ordinances throughout the Word of God. It, um, you have to be a pretty good uh, student of God's Word to know what Christ fulfilled. And really, it's not that complicated. You can read the second chapter of Colossians. Everything that was nailed to the cross, Christ basically became. Example, blood ordinances were nailed to the cross. That means Christ's blood is the sacrifice for one and all times. You start sacrificing blood and you're being sacrilegious. 
It's the, one of the greatest sins you could do because it stopped right there. All blood ordinances ended with the shedding of Christ's blood. He said, place all Sabbaths on the cross. Why? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, Christ became our Passover, which is the high Sabbath of Christianity. So he became our Sabbath also. But all through the Word of God, you have advice and ordinances and commandments, statutes. And um, pretty good advice to take his advice. Elizabeth from Illinois. Is it a sin to go to a fortune teller? My husband says it is in the Bible, that doesn't, but he doesn't know where. The witch of Endor. Um, Saul in the Old Testament sent to the witch of Endor, okay? And that, that's a big sin. I, I heard you say that to say your prayers out loud as the devil, to not do it as the devil can hear and might hear them and cause bad things. Well, if you're ever... If you're ever planning something that's extremely important, the less said and the less people that know about it until you get it nailed, the better off. That's just good business, but at the same time, it's true. If you're working a work for Almighty God, Satan, and, and it's successful, Satan will try everything in the book to throw uh, stones against that ministry, but you don't have to worry. God will punish them severely. And uh, you don't have to worry about it. God's on the throne. He's in control. And you keep plowing. Joyce from Kentucky. Pastor Murray, does the Bible tell where the Ark of the Covenant is now located? Yes, it does. It, um, and and uh, you'll find it in Revelation chapter 11, the last two verses. The Ark of the Covenant, which is that, coven that um, ark, it's in heaven. Well, how did it get there? Well, God took it. Man couldn't seem to handle it. And um, quite frankly, you'll find it there. Uh, many people, uh, uh, we know that Elijah, as well as uh, one, one or two others, uh, but mainly Elijah, uh, a vehicle came and picked him up. And what did he take with him? Well, it's in heaven, the ark is. Uh, Karen from Florida. I read there were 400 silent years between the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 of the New Testament. Can you shed light on this statement? Well, I wouldn't call them silent. There's, there is history, Josephus, uh, and, and, but, and you have the Apocrypha, which are the hidden books uh, called. And, and in the original King James, as well as many other uh, renditions of God's Word. You have those Apocrypha, uh, uh, books of the Apocrypha, and they cover that period of time. So they're, they're not silent. They're, they're history. Okay, um, we got Bo from Ohio. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, was Lazarus raised in his glorified spiritual body or in a flesh body. He was raised in a flesh body. It was a special thing. I mean, he was bound from head to foot in burial cloth, wound. And uh, Christ said, Lazarus, come forth. He couldn't walk. He was wound up, but he came forth. He floated forth, if you would. It was to prove a point, and they released him. And he was, it was his flesh body. He was alive because he partook of food and so forth uh, right there. Christ was showing that he defeats death. Our Heavenly Father is a God of life, not death. No one has died spiritually. Even Satan himself is, is um, helped by Michael in heaven until he's cast out. So uh, no one... Chapter 8, the great book of St. Saint, of Saint John. St. John, chapter 8, the closing verses. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Uh, okay, if, if in his flesh body, then this means his flesh body had to die twice. To prove the point of Almighty God, I wouldn't say he died. Okay, they buried him, but um, Christ didn't let him die. And it was to prove that God's in control. 
it was a special occasion. Michael from Texas. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, Lucifer declares that he has a throne in his, in this, just another of the devil's lies, and it was really Christ's throne that the devil lusted after. Uh, of course it was, but, but he, even the side of the north, as it is written there, he tries to take. But that, that's no great mystery. When you read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Satan sits on, in Jerusalem on the throne of God claiming to be God. Okay. It's going to happen. That's when he comes as Antichrist. Uh, Joy from Colorado. Who is Mother Israel, and can you explain more on this, please? It's a figure of speech. Uh, there are 12 tribes of, of uh, Israel, and naturally the, we speak of Israel as a female, the, a, the nation, and naturally we call her Mother Israel. Um, she is called basically or implied mother, when she is discussed even back into the first earth age, as you will read in Revelation chapter 12. And then going on into the mother who would conceive a child and Satan would try to destroy him, which was Mary giving birth to Christ and Satan trying to destroy Christ by crucifixion. But then Christ would say in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, I came to the earth to be crucified whereby in so doing, I can destroy death, which is to say the devil. The devil is death, if you follow him. Uh, E.B. from Iowa. Although a student of the chapel for 15 years, I have somewhat missed the meaning of the word preparation in the phrase, having shod your feet in preparation of the gospel of peace in Ephesians 6.15. This phrase is not used in connection with any of the other pieces of the armor of God. Can you help me to understand? Well, when you put on your shoes, um, what are you fixing to do? What are you about to accomplish when you put on your shoes? These were for travel, for moving. So plan ahead where you move, what you do, and what you say. Well, how do I do that? From the Word of God. That's how you prepare yourself. And what you want to do is be sure in that preparation that you have on that girt, which is your belt that holds your britches up. Because that girt is the Word of God. You got no Word of God, you're going to lose your britches. Okay. So put the shoes on, but think where you're going, what you're going to do. Prepare. Think beforehand. Uh, Michael from Mississippi. Thank you for your teachings. I was just saved Saturday, and I was wanting to see if there is any information you could give me. I'm 11 years old, and my father and I watch your program every day. Well, it, 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 I can give you some of the best advice in the world now that you're saved and you love the Lord and he certainly loves you. Let him know you love him. Don't forget, let, don't, doesn't hurt, tell him every day, Father, I love you. That brings his blessings in your life. And even if you're about to make a mistake, many times he will get your attention and correct it. I believe that, and I know you do too. And so congratulations, it's good to have you aboard. Uh, Sabrina from Colorado. Pastor Murray, as the Christmas season approaches, can you help me with scripture to know whether this is a Christian holiday to be observed or is this a tradition of men? Um, we'll be showing a Christmas program soon. Christ's conception, not birth, took place on December the 25th. That is real easy documented in the manuscripts, in the Word of God, in Luke chapter 1. For uh, we know that um, uh, Zechariah, who was a Levitical priest, the husband of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, was of the course of Abiah. That's a date. Okay. And when he went from his serving the course in the temple of Abiah, an angel appeared and told him that Elizabeth was going to conceive, and six months later, from that particular course of Abiah, which is a date, then 
Mary herself was approached by Gabriel, the Holy Spirit, then also, and she conceived. He went directly to Elizabeth, and when she approached Elizabeth, John, who was six months in the womb, leapt, meaning he felt the presence of the Holy Spirit on the day of conception. So when did Christ actually start being with us? On the day of conception, December the 25th. So you'll see the Christmas program soon. It'll be shown in December two or three times. Be, be aware of it. Uh, James, age 10, from West Virginia. My friends tell me that farmers have to believe in sun gods and water gods or something like that. Is that true? No, it is not. It is not. But farmers have to be very intelligent people. They have to know that um, when what uh, they have to know, you don't plant seeds in the winter time. You plant seeds in the spring. And also, you have your cattle where they produce their young in the spring, so there is grass that they can graze all day and plenty of water necessarily. And they have to know where the moon is that raises the ocean at tide about 15 feet, that when it passes over the earth, also it also raises the surface moisture. And therefore, you can plant root crops. But that's not a god. That's just a fact of the way God created nature. Farmers are extremely intelligent people if they're successful. And they know these things because God made them in that way. And he gave us, as it is written in the first chapter of the great book of Genesis, those things for signs and seasons, the season to do things and be successful. They from Pennsylvania. The question for I have you is, the people who have died and went to paradise, can they see and hear what is going on down here on earth? Um, my husband of 52 uh, plus years uh, passed away. Well, I'm, our condolences, and um, uh, they, no one has passed away. They're all with the Father, and they are cognate, and they're happy. Um, even whichever side of the gulf their own, basically, if they have a, a little understanding, but especially on the side that overcomes, they're extremely happy and, um, and are very aware of events that transpire. They're not, they, they know have now that they are in spiritual bodies, they have 100% recall and 100% use of their mind rather than only about 10. And so they're pretty well aware of everything and, and happy. Lee from Illinois. My question, if Mary was made with child with the Holy Spirit on the 25th of December, why do we have this birth date on December the 25th? Thank you and God bless you. Because of ignorance, one thing, it, it, it had t time and period goes by, and we don't have that many scholars of God's Word. Because as I forestated, Luke chapter 1 is a date. It definitely tells you that the conception took place on December the 25th. You that are fortunate enough to have companion Bibles, you have an entire appendix on the conception, and even every, it lets you know every month, every day, what day he was uh, even uh, was uh, circumcised and blessed. All right, it's it's all right there, worked out for you. It doesn't really matter. He when the moment at conception, the spirit dwells in the woman's womb. It's a human being. Um, the fact that Christ approached in, in Mary on day of conception, John let in Luke 1 documents that from the word of the living God. Um, Michael from Oklahoma, would you please explain for me John 14 chapter verses 1 through 3 for me? Well, it's some of the most beautiful verses in God's word. I, uh, in my father's house are many mansions. The word mansions in the Greek is mono, and it means resting places. And, and what it means is, is in father's house, you're going to find rest, which is peace of mind. Knowing truth, it takes away all anxieties and hang-ups. And that horn of power that comes forth, God allows it. It is 
awesome, very awesome. And, um, and uh, he says, um, I go there even to prepare a place for you. And, um, and so it is that we have that. But any time God and the Holy Spirit dwell with you and in you, you've got that rest. That's what he's talking about. The mansion is not some big, huge building in heaven. It simply means you've got rest in that spiritual body as well as in flesh bodies today. Bill from Maine. Uh, Genesis 9.19, please explain this. I am unclear. Um, many people don't realize that God set Noah's family aside as it's written in Genesis chapter 6. If you miss that, you kind of lose out. Noah's family was the on, only family that was a perfect generation of the children of Eth ha Adam. That's Adam through whom would come Christ. Not the other races that were created on the sixth day. It was good. God loves them. But through this one would come Christ. And then, um, so in the verse you're talking about, it says the earth was repopulated with the three sons of Noah. Well, it was, but only the Adamic people, not the other races. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But most of all, you know what? God loves you for it. Hey, it makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. If you bless him, he will always bless you. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, again, blessing God, he will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word, it's a good day even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The book of Mark. Mark, one of the apostles, Mark having been a very young lad at the time Christ walked this earth, was always in the shadows, observing and listening with the intensity that young ears can, picking up every word. And this great gospel moves very fast. But what a, what a interesting and certainly impressive gospel it is for Mark from those that young mind reiterates to you in chapter 13 how some are going to be delivered up, exactly what they are supposed to do, and even in that 13th chapter giving you the seven events that fulfill this, or make up the seven seals and the seven trumpets and telling you how you are to react to them. A fast-moving gospel, one that I know you'll enjoy.
Lubbock, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, you know what? We're going to just visit a while here through this week, do some specials, talk about perhaps some special things. I want to talk to you perhaps tonight, maybe even again tomorrow night, about law versus grace. That's not really a fair statement, but I'm going to make it anyway. And when we 